Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the opioid receptors. Okay, so we've discussed now the endogenous opioids, which are the uh, ligands that the human body naturally has uh, for uh, the opioid receptors. So we've seen examples uh, include beta endorphin, uh, leucine enkephalin, methionine enkephalin, and dynofin, uh, which are all uh, agonists for uh, all three of the, well, the mu opioid receptor, the kappa opioid receptor, and the delta opioid receptor. And then there's finally this other endogenous opioid, orphanin PQ uh, slash nociceptin, uh, which is an agonist then for the opioid receptor like 1. Okay, what I now want to discuss is the exogenous agonists for opioid receptors, so the drugs uh, that we can use to stimulate uh, these opioid receptors. And specifically, we're going to look at the mu opioid receptor. So everything we do now, we'll be talking about the mu opioid receptor rather than the uh, other three. Okay, and that's because most of the um, physiological effects of uh, the um, exogenous opioids which we administer are through the mu opioid receptor, okay? So this is the most widely studied. Right, uh, so uh, before we actually discuss these different agonists and antagonists, I just want to make sure we're all familiar with the concept of a full agonist, a partial agonist, an antagonist, and we might as well do it even though we're not going to actually need it, also an inverse agonist. Okay, so basically, this is the concept, okay? We have our opioid receptor, and we'll say it's the mu opioid receptor, okay? So here it is, it's this rhodopsin family G protein coupled receptor. So it has these seven membrane spanning alpha helices, like so. Okay, now, basically, the G protein coupled receptor we know can go into a state where it can activate the um, downstream um, signaling molecule, basically. Okay, so it can activate the heterotrimeric GI G protein. So what we're going to do is we're going to model this receptor as having two states, basically. It has the inactive state. Now, this is a very sort of basic model, and of course, if you think about this for long enough, you'll realize that it's rubbish. Um, but this is the model that generally we do use because it's so simple. Okay, and it is remarkably effective. Okay, so we're going to model the receptors having two states. The inactive state, which we'll denote as R for just receptor. So this is the inactive state. Okay, and this is the state where the receptor cannot bind to the heterotrimeric G protein. Okay. And then we'll also have the active state, which we'll call R star, which is the state where the receptor can bind to the heterotrimeric GI G protein. Okay, now if you just have a cell which has many of these opioid receptors in, many of these mu opioid receptors in, then basically some of them will be in the inactive state and some of them will be in the active state, okay? Even when there is no ligands present, a few of them will be in the active state, i.e. it's not a case that they're all in the inactive state. There is an equilibrium, okay? Most of them will probably be in the inactive state, but some of them will be in the active state. So basically there is this reversible reaction where the receptors can go from being in the inactive state to being in the active state, and then back from the active state to the inactive state. So usually, there is always some receptors which are in the active state even before the ligand has bound, and these ones will be activating GI heterotrimeric G proteins. Okay, so there is going to be a basal level of activation of the downstream signaling pathway. Okay, so this is the concept of a bit of basal level signaling of the downstream signaling pathway. So you're always getting some of the uh, GI pathway activated. Okay, uh, and this is because some of these receptors will be in the active state even before the ligand has bound. So what does the ligand then do? Well, basically, uh, an agonist, let's start off with an agonist then. What does an agonist do?
basically agonists combine to the receptor and what they do is they stabilize the active state okay so agonists prefer to be bound to a receptor that is in the active state rather than the inactive state so basically we've got receptors always going between the inactive state and the active state now at the moment the forward reaction is very slow the chance that an receptor will go from the inactive state to the active state is quite low and the backwards reaction is very fast the chance that an active state receptor will go to the inactive state is very high okay but if we bind this drug what it will do is it will potentially speed up the forward reaction and moreover slow down the backwards reaction okay so it might bump up the forward reaction and bump down the backwards reaction okay so now more inactive state receptors are going to go into the active state and some of them will stay there now rather than just instantly going back okay so this is going to shift the equilibrium so that the number or the fraction of receptors that are in this active state compared to the inactive state is going to be much greater Okay, and then the uh, amount of downstream pathway that they will activate is going to be greater. Now, of course, you will realize from this that there are different levels of agonists. Some agonists will be better than others, okay? So, for instance, um, if we have an agonist which hugely increases the forward reaction and hugely decreases the backwards reaction, so let's say it does this, okay, we'll call this pink agonist. So let's say pink agonist does this. It hugely speeds up that forward reaction and hugely reduces down the backward reaction. Then the percentage of receptors that will end up at equilibrium being in the active state is going to be much greater than orange agonist, which did this one that we looked at first. So it speeds the forward one up to that and slows the backwards one down to that. Okay, so the actual fraction of receptors at equilibrium that will be in the active state when bound to the orange uh, agonist is going to be much lower than the number for pink agonist. Okay, so which is the more powerful agonist? What's well, pink agonist? Okay, so this is the concept of efficacy. Okay, so this is saying assume that your ligand binds to every single one of your receptors. So we're not worrying about affinity now. We're not worrying about how many of the ligand molecules actually bind. Let's assume that ligand molecules bind to every single one of the mu opioid receptors. Now, even when the ligand is bound, some of them will be in the inactive state and some of them will be in the active state. Now, what fraction of them will be in the active state and what fraction of them will be in the inactive state, that is to do with the efficacy, basically, of the drug. Okay, so to make this clear, uh, we'll demote the mu opioid receptor just for the ease of drawing uh, to being represented as a box, basically. Okay, so these boxes now represent different mu opioid receptors. So we are assuming that every single mu opioid receptor has uh, a ligand molecule bound to it. Okay, so let's say they've all got ligand molecules bound to it, which will show in blue here. And of course, it should be binding to the transmembrane regions, but I'll, we're just doing a simple picture here. So assume they've all got ligand molecules bound. So I'm not worrying at all about affinity at the moment. Affinity, of course, would tell you that um, would tell you how many ligand molecules would bind, because of course ligand molecules will have differing affinities for binding. Okay, so it would tell you what fraction of the receptors actually would have ligand bound. But we'll assume that the affinity is 100%. Basically, that all of them have ligand molecules bound. The point is that not all of these receptors will now be in the active state, okay? Some of them will be in this active state, which I'll denote by red, okay? So let's say this one's in the active state, this one's in the active state, this one's in the active state, and this one's in the active state, okay? And let's say this one over here in turquoise is in the inactive state, okay? Even when it's got the ligand bound, this would mean that when all of them have the ligand bound, um, 80% of them will actually be in the active state. Now, if we then had a other, another agonist, which when it was bound, 100% of them were in the active state, that would be a more powerful agonist. Okay, so what I'm trying to uh, tell you is that 
efficacy tells you how good the drug molecule is at stabilizing the receptor in the active state. So what it's all about is at equilibrium, if of the receptors which have ligand molecules bound to them, what fraction of them will be in the active state and what fraction of them will be in the inactive state. So that's what efficacy is all about. Okay, Affinity tells you if you've got all your receptors on the cell, and you've doused it in a certain concentration of the drug, what fraction of them will even have a ligand molecule bound to them? Okay, so what you then do is take the ones which have a ligand molecule bound to them, and then you have to worry about efficacy, i.e. what fraction of those ones which actually have a ligand molecule bound to them will then actually uh, be um, in the active state. Okay, so how much effect a drug molecule will have is a mixture of its affinity and its efficacy. But we're only going to worry about efficacy rather than affinity. Okay, so, okay, let's do the terms then now. What's a full agonist? What's a partial agonist? And what's an antagonist? And what's an inverse agonist? Okay, so basically, you will notice that there are uh, different levels of agonism, basically. Okay, uh, so a full agonist is one which produces the same level of downstream activation, basically, as a endogenous ligand. Okay, so these are drugs which will produce and have an equal efficacy to the endogenous ligand. Okay. So, equal efficacy to endogenous ligand, okay, uh, i.e., of the receptors which uh, have the ligand molecule bound, uh, the percentage of those receptors which will be in the active state uh, will be the same as the percentage of the ligand of the um, ligand occupied receptors which will be in the active state for the endogenous ligands, i.e., the endorphins. Okay, so equal efficacy to endogenous ligand. So the actual ability of these drug molecules to activate the receptor uh, is the same as uh, the endogenous ligand. Okay, a partial agonist is something where the efficacy is lower than the endogenous agonist. Okay, so of the receptors where the ligand molecule is bound, the fraction of them that will be in the active state is lower than the fraction that will be in the active state if that ligand was instead the endogenous agonist. Okay, so lower efficacy than at the endogenous ligands. The ability of this ligand to actually activate the receptor and therefore trigger the downstream pathway is lower than the endogenous ligand. Lower efficacy, efficacy uh, compared to um, the endogenous ligand. Okay, now an antagonist basically is a uh, drug molecule which binds to the receptor and has no effect on the um, on the um, uh, well the ability the preference of the receptor for being in the inactive and the active state okay so an antagonist just binds to the receptor and blocks the binding site for agonists but has no effect on how much the of the receptor is in the active state compared to the inactive state. So let's say originally maybe 5% of the receptors were in the active state and 95% of them were in the inactive state. Okay, that was the equilibrium when there was no ligand bound. When you bind the antagonist, even if you bind an antagonist molecule to every single receptor, uh, there is basically no change in the percentages of the receptors which are in the active state compared to the inactive state. Okay, so uh, they have absolutely no effect on the position of equilibrium between the active state and the inactive state. All they do is they block the binding site, so they stop other molecules from being able to come in and bind to the receptor. Okay, so uh, no effect on efficacy. Okay, so no efficacy. They have affinity, so they'll bind to the receptor, but they have no efficacy. They don't change uh, the um, fraction of the receptors which will be in the active state compared to the inactive state from when the receptors have no ligand bound to them. And then finally, the concept of an inverse agonist is the concept uh, that some drugs can actually bind to the receptor and change it the other way, 
okay? So remember, there's this equilibrium between the receptor and the activated receptor, okay? And originally, it was something like this. There was a tiny um, f um, movement forward, but then a large movement back. So the equilibrium might have been something like 5% in this state, 95% in this state, okay? And that was with no ligand bound. Basically, if you put an inverse agonist, it will either reduce this one or increase the one backwards, or both potentially. The point is that it will tip the equilibrium towards this one, so it might go to something like 98% of them are in this state, and 2% of them are in this state. So actually, inverse agonists reduce the basal level of activation of the downstream pathway. Okay? Reduce the basal level of activation of the downstream pathway. Okay, so that's the difference between a full agonist, a partial agonist, an antagonist, and an inverse agonist. So what we now want to do is look at examples of full agonists, partial agonists, and some antagonists of mu opioid receptors. Okay, so we'll start off with full agonists. So these are drug molecules which will bind to mu opioid receptors and uh, their ability to activate the mu opioid receptors is equal to the endogenous uh, ligands, basically. Okay, so examples of these drugs are etorphine, okay, which is a very potent analgesic uh, that isn't used in uh, clinical medicine. Uh, it is used in um, animal um, medicine, it's used in veterinary medicine, uh, but it's something like a thousand times more potent than morphine, so it's not safe. It would cause uh, respiratory depression. Okay, uh, then we also have methadone, which is another example of a uh, full agonist. Now, methadone um, has a number of other interactions which are responsible for its numerous side effects. Um, Okay, but they are both full agonists at the mu opioid receptor, so their ability to activate the mu opioid receptor, their efficacy at the mu opioid receptor, is the same as the endogenous agonists. Okay, notice that morphine is not a full agonist of mu opioid receptors. It's instead what would be called a partial agonist. Okay, so morphine is a partial agonist, so its ability to... Um, activate the mu opioid receptors is less than the endogenous ligands, basically. Okay? Now, that might surprise you because of how effective morphine is as a painkiller, uh, but it is actually less effective than the endogenous ligands. Right. Now, I just want to go back to discuss heroin, because heroin isn't actually a ligand in itself. Instead, it is metabolized into morphine. Okay, so if we get back our picture of heroin right from the start. Okay, so here we have our picture of heroin, uh, diacetyl morphine here. Basically, the reason heroin is extremely effective is that these acetyl groups bound to the alcohol groups allow heroin to cross the blood-brain barrier. So it goes from the blood into the brain, and then when it gets into the brain, uh, it then has the acetyl groups chopped off. Okay, and then becomes morphine, and morphine can then act on the mu opioid receptors. But the point is that heroin is metabolized to morphine. Okay, and it's morphine that actually has the activity on the uh, mu opioid receptors. Okay, right. Uh, other examples of partial agonists, which are actually weaker than morphines, they're less good than morphine. Morphines are reasonably strong partial agonist. The ones we're coming on to are sometimes called weak agonists, okay, but they are partial agonists. Uh, but this is just to get across the point that they are weaker at um, activating the receptor even than morphine. Okay, uh, so examples are the drug codeine, which is a over-the-counter painkiller, and another example is dextropropoxyphene. Uh, okay, so dextropropoxyphene is another example of a weak agonist at uh, mu opioid receptors. So dextropropoxyphene. Right, okay, so those are weak agonists. Uh, next, let's move on to some quite interesting drugs, which are actually what are known as mixed agonists, because 
they are agonists at certain mu opioid receptors, but they're actually antagonists at the mu opioid receptors. Okay, so you could call them mixed agonists slash antagonists. Okay, so uh, they will bind to uh, the um, mu opioid receptor and they act as antagonists at the mu opioid receptor, so they have no effect basically on the uh, activation state of the receptor. Okay, but they're actually agonists at the uh, kappa opioid receptor. Okay, so drugs in this category are nalorphine, okay, and also um, pentazosine, okay. So nalorphine and pentazosine are examples of mixed agonists slash antagonists at the opioid receptors. So they are agonists at the kappa opioid receptors, okay, so they're agonists at these receptors. Uh, so they will activate those receptors, but they are antagonists with regards to the mu opioid receptors. So they bind to the mu opioid receptors, and they block the activation of those receptors. Now, I want to stress an important point, okay, which is that often it is not possible to decide whether a drug is actually an antagonist or whether it's an inverse agonist. And let me stress why. Because, w with a few exceptions, nature has done an extremely good job of making sure that most receptors, when they do not have ligands bound to them, are completely in the inactive state. For instance, if you take a receptor such as the rhodopsin receptor, which is a receptor for light, it's something like one rhodopsin receptor will turn into the active state spontaneously without being hit by light every 400 years or something. So the forward reaction is just negligible. And to all extents and purposes, all of the receptors are sitting as the inactive state all of the time, and there are none in the active state. That means that the basal level of activation of the downstream pathway is negligible also. Therefore, it would be very difficult to decide whether these drugs uh, were antagonists, i.e. they sat and bound the receptor and had no effect on the, um, the preference of the receptor for being in the inactive state compared to the active state, or whether they are actually binding and actually increasing the uh, preference for the inactive state compared to the active state, but we just can't see that because the effect is so negligible. So it is likely that most of the drugs that we call antagonists are actually inverse agonists. So often you will hear these sort of called together as just antagonists, okay? So you'll often hear inverse agonists referred to as antagonists. Strictly speaking, they shouldn't be called antagonists. Strictly speaking, antagonists should be referred for a drug that has absolutely no efficacy on the receptor. Uh, it does not change the preference of the receptor for being in the inactive state compared to the active state. But if you actually think about how difficult it would be for a drug to bind equally well to the inactive state as it does to the active state, you will realize that it's it would be very difficult for a drug to actually be a true antagonist. So often, most of the drugs we know actually are inverse agonists. It's just you can't see that they're inverse agonists because the basal level of activity of the downstream pathway is so negligible that you can't actually you measure a change in it, basically, okay? So, sometimes to stress a true antagonist that really has no efficacy, people will call it a neutral antagonist, and they will use antagonists to denote the class of neutral antagonists and inverse agonists, okay? But you should be very careful about the terminology, because as I say, people will use antagonist um, sometimes to mean neutral antagonists and sometimes to mean inverse agonists collectively, and it's because you really can't tell whether the drug actually is a neutral antagonist or an inverse agonist. It's most likely that it's an inverse agonist, but there are drugs that are true neutral antagonists, so it could be, uh, it, but m in most cases it just isn't known and it's just not, doesn't matter really, okay? Uh, but that's a little sort of a hole to fall into with the notation.
Okay, so try to use antagonist to mean a drug which really has no efficacy, uh, but you will catch people using it to mean a uh, neutral antagonist or an inverse agonist. Okay, so uh, these two drugs are mu opioid receptor antagonists, okay? Uh, so they will bind to the receptor and most likely they might have a little bit of inverse agonist effect but the basal level of the mu opioid receptor activity isn't that high, it's very negligible, okay? So really the distinction between inverse agonists and neutral antagonists only becomes important in receptors where the basal level is non-trivial, okay? And the archetypal example of that would be the histamine 2 receptor. Okay, but we're not talking about histamine 2 receptors, so it doesn't matter. Okay, right, so these drugs are interesting because they will agonize one of the opioid receptors and antagonize another. Okay, right. So the final drugs to talk about are uh, just the mu opioid receptor antagonists, okay? And again, I use this word antagonists in this sense here where I'm meaning they're either neutral antagonists or most likely they're slightly inverse agonists. Okay, so antagonists for the mu opioid receptor. Okay, now these drugs are very, very useful when people have taken an overdose um, of opioids, okay? Uh, maybe of morphine, for instance, because the, the risk of taking an overdose of opioids is that it causes respiratory failure, basically. And the reason it can do this is because in order for you to continue breathing, the diaphragm has to receive signals continuously from the brain, okay? And I'll get another piece of paper to do this. So, basically, if we have the diaphragm here, okay, so let me show this. So here is the chest, okay, the thoracic cavity, and then basically you have the diaphragm here, so I'll show it in pink, okay, and basically what has to happen is the diaphragm has to contract, and when it contracts it sort of pulls down, so it will go into this sort of position here, and that will bring in air into the lungs. Now what triggers the contraction of the diaphragm? Well, you have two important nerves on either side, okay, known as the phrenic nerves. So these are the phrenic nerves. Okay, and basically these have axons uh, coming down which will then terminate on the skeletal muscle fibers of the diaphragm here and they will trigger uh, the contraction of the skeletal muscle fibers of the diaphragm. Okay, and that will cause the contraction of the diaphragm down to this position which will cause inspiration basically. Okay, now, basically, the axon terminals of these neurons in the phrenic nerve have opioid receptors in them, okay? Mu opioid receptors, specifically, okay? And uh, these mu opioid receptors will then trigger the pathways that we've looked at before. They'll trigger hyperpolarization and also inactivation of the voltage-gated calcium channels, and they will stop the release of neurotransmitter from the axon terminals of the axons of the phrenic nerve onto the skeletal muscle fibers of the diaphragm. And when that happens, the diaphragm will stop contracting. And that's known as respiratory depression, okay? And that's often what kills people when they take opioid uh, overdoses, okay? Because they literally stop breathing. Okay, right. So this is the dangerous part of these drugs. Now, how do we treat uh, opioid overdose? Well, basically, we put in drugs which will bind to these uh, mu opioid receptors here and will not activate the mu opioid receptors, so have, in principle, no efficacy, although, again, they may have slight inverse agonist activity. Um, and they sit there and stop the uh, opioid drugs, such as morphine, from being able to bind to the mu opioid receptor and activate it. Okay, so they block the um, opioid uh, from activating uh, the mu opioid receptor by binding in the space that the uh, opioid, such as morphine, wants to bind in. Okay, so examples of these drugs which are very clinically useful uh, are uh, naloxone and also naltrexone. Okay, so antagonists for mu opioid receptors.
Okay, so you have naloxone, which is a mu opioid receptor antagonist and is very commonly clinically used uh, for to treat morphine overdose or heroin or overdose. Uh, and then we also have naltrexone. Okay, which is another mu opioid receptor antagonist. And again, I would stress that we can't really tell the difference between whether these are actual true antagonists or neutral antagonists and whether they might have slight inverse agonist activity. Okay, but it doesn't really matter for the mu opioid receptor because the basal activity is not that high. Okay, right. So now we've discussed ligands, we've discussed agonists, full agonists, partial agonists, uh, and antagonists, okay? In the next video, what we now want to discuss is how uh, opioids have their analgesic effects.